You mentioned uh, the infinity problem and the Hawking problem. Uh, which Hawking problem? The the that the black hole destroys information, or that the what what which Hawking problem are we talking about? Well, there's really two Hawking problems. They're very closely related. Um, one is how does the black hole store the information, yes. and um, that is the one that we solved in some cases. So it's sort of like um, you know, your your smartphone, how does it store its 64 gigabytes? Well, you rip the cover off and you count the chips and there's 64 of them, each with a gigabyte, mm -hmm. and you know there's 64 gigabytes. But that does not solve the problem of how you get information in and out of your smartphone. You have to understand a lot more about the Wi-Fi and the internet and the uh, cellular and... And, and that's so, where Hawking radiation, this prediction it starts to come That's where point. Hawking radiation comes in. And that problem of how the information gets in and out, you can't, you couldn't have explained how information gets in and out of an iPhone without first explaining how it's stored in the first place. Yeah. So just to clarify, the storage is on the plate? Is on, on, the, on the plate. The, on the holographic plate, and then it projects somehow inside the, the the bulk the the, the space time is the hologram the hologram but man I mean did you have an intuitive when you sit late at night and you stare out at the, at the stars do you have an intuitive understanding of what a holographic plate is um like that there's two dimension you know, projections that store information how a black hole could store information on a holographic plate, I think we do understand in, in great mathematical detail and also intuitively, and it's very much like an ordinary hologram where you have a holographic plate and you sh it contains all the information, you shine a light through it, yeah. and you get an image which looks three-dimensional. Yeah, but why should there be a holographic plate? Like what? Why should there be? Yeah, why? <laughs> that is the great thing about being a theoretical physicist is anybody can very quickly stump you with they going to the next level of whys. Yeah, like, so, why so if you're asking, blue, I can just keep asking. Yes. Yeah, you could just keep asking and, and it won't take you very long to... So the trick in being a, theor a yeah. theoretical physics is finding the questions that you can answer. Sure. So so the questions that we think we might be able to answer now, and we've partially answered, is that um, there is a holographic explanation for certain s kinds of things in string theory. Sure. We've answered that. Now we'd like to take what we've learned, and that's what I've mostly been doing for the last 15, 20 years. I haven't really been working so much on string theory proper. I've been sort of taking the lessons that you we learned in string theory and trying to apply them to the real world using only, assuming only what we know for sure about the real world. Uh, so on this uh, topic, you, you co-wrote, co-authored a paper with Stephen Hawking called Soft Hair on Black Holes. Yes. That makes the argument against Hawking's original prediction that black holes destroy information. Can you explain this paper? Yes. And the title. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, um, the hair on black holes is a word that was coined by the greatest phrase master in the history of physics, John Wheeler, invented the word black hole. Mm -hmm. And he also said that, uh, he made the statement that black holes have no hair. Mm -hmm. That is, every black hole in the universe uh, is described just by its mass and spin. Uh, they, wrote, they can also rotate as was later shown by Kerr. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is very much unlike a star, right? Every star of the same mass is different 
in a multitude of different ways, um, different chemical compositions, different motions of the individual molecules. Every star in the universe, even of the same mass, is different in many, many different ways. Black holes are all the same. And that means when you throw some, in Einstein's description of them, mm -hmm. which we think must be corrected. And um, if you throw something into a black hole, it gets sucked in. And if you uh, throw in a red book or a blue book, the black hole gets a little bigger, but there's no way within Einstein's theory of telling uh, how they're different. And that was one of the assumptions that Hawking made in his 1974-75 papers in which he concluded that black holes destroy information. You can throw encyclopedias, thesis defenses, the Library of Congress. It doesn't matter, it's going to uh, behave exactly the same uniform way. Yeah. So. What what Hawking and I showed, and also Malcolm Perry, um, is that um, one has to be very careful about what happens at the boundary of the black hole. And this gets back to something I mentioned earlier about when two things which are related by a coordinate transformation are and are not equivalent. And um, and what we showed is that there are very subtle imprints when you throw something into a black hole. There are very subtle imprints left on the horizon of the black hole, which you can read off at least partially what went in. And um, so this invalidates uh, Stevens' original uh, argument that the information is destroyed. And that's the soft hair. Those that's the imprints. soft hair, right. So, and soft is a word that is used in physics for things which have very low energy. And these things actually carry no energy. There are things in the universe which carry no energy. 